Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily. Couple weeks and I'd go crazy, crazy. Yeah, I need you on the regular, the regular. Yeah, I need you. Yeah, I'm telling ya, I'm telling ya. Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily. Hi, welcome to Divas with Debbie. So today we're just gonna look at Isaiah 23. So I want to show you guys a little bit of context. So we're looking at two cities and really focusing on t one. So the two cities are Tyre <clears throat> and Sidon. So here in a map, we have, you know, Europe. We have Tyre right there. And Sidon right there. About 20 miles apart. Um, and... What we know is that they were major high traffic port cities on the Mediterranean Sea, about 20 miles apart in Phoenicia at the time of this writing. And right now it's modern day Lebanon. So um, let's get to it. So Tyre at the time was sort of synonymous for commerce or materialism and one of the names that it had was Babylon of the sea so we know it's like it's pretty fancy successful maybe a little overindulgent and what mattered was that you had money um and so this particular chapter um Isaiah is ha uh, pronouncing an oracle concerning Tyre and Sidon and once I just like learned that these are port cities, a lot of the language makes sense because he's talking about the sea. Whale, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is laid waste without house or harbor. A lot of the language is coast, sea, waters, you know, stuff like this, talking about this. Um, and we know the success of this city says you were the merchant of the nations. So really this is a key location where lots of um, traffic was and exchange. And later on we hear an interesting um, analogy presented which sort of likens it to Babylon. So Babylon is likened in Revelation as the prostitute um, who, you know, would go and sleep with the various kings of the nation. Um, and it's kind of a cringy, like, image, you know, to read its scripture. Scripture is full of interesting things. Um, and yet here we see that Tyre is likened again to a prostitute. Um, says she will return to her wages and will prostitute herself with the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. That's verse 17 of 23 in Isaiah. And we sort of see she, in her exchange, has this, um, we, the connotations that come with prostitutes is that it's not done right. Something's just not holy about those transactions. Something's just, I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but we all have those connotations. Um, of course, we're not going to jump into this, you know, how Jesus interacts with women. Jesus loves um, people um, despite their sin and despite their past, but he calls them out of it. And he says, you know, come like, like, you're forgiven, but, like, go and sin no more. So, anyways, we have this image. So, we know that she's interacting a lot with the different nations, the different kingdoms, in ways that probably aren't the best. Um, but they're profitable to her and beneficial to the other nations in their perspective. And it's very much built on pleasure. And so, with that knowledge... Um, God has a message, <laughs> which is, I'm going to lay you to waste. He says, verse 9, this is a really interesting verse. 
The Lord of hosts has purposed it to defile the pompous pride of all glory, to dishonor all the honored of the earth. God just has a disgust for pride. And, and it makes sense because when you see someone who's prideful, it's just like, ooh. <laughs> and it's harder to recognize in yourself sometimes, but it's just not attractive. Confidence is. Pride, mm, not so much. Um, God is going to lay to waste. It is in his purpose plans, lay to waste, tired. And we see this happen twice, I believe. You know, we see it happen with the Babylonians conquering um, Tyre. And then we also see it later with Assyria and I believe uh, Alexander the Great. So, um, we see it laid to ruin. And that's the kind of language that this passage says, you know, bare, laid to ruin, like uh, there will be anguish, you know, and everybody's going to uh, be sad about this because obviously they were benefiting from this city. Um, and yet it says, like, Tyre's going to be forgotten for 70 years. Um, and then at the end of the 70 years, verse 17, the Lord will visit Tyre and she will return to her wages and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Her merchandise and her wages will be holy to the Lord. It will not be stored or hoarded, but her merchandise will supply abundant food and fine clothing for those who dwell before the Lord. We have a change. No longer is the... Um, God is leveraging the strategic location of Tyre for his glory now. And this time, the, the city of Tyre is, yes, having success with her merchant, merchandise and just her economy. But this time, God's going to put the economy to, his, to, to work for him and basically bring food and clothing to those who serve him. Um... And that he's going to set aside her wages to be holy to the Lord. It's very interesting. Um, what I'm particularly struck by is in verse 17 when it says the Lord will visit Tyre. You know, his, his presence is going to come back there in mercy, really. Um, and, and restore it for his glory. And I, I don't entirely have... Um, clearly I don't have a lot of knowledge. I'm even stumbling over my words all of today. <laughs> but, um, I was drawn to Acts 21, 1 through 7, that actually has Paul visiting Tyre. And Paul, again, actually the map that I showed you guys earlier was a part of his journey, Paul's missionary journey. And he does go to Tyre and Sidon. Um, the Sidon's addressed here in the title. It doesn't really come across in Isaiah 23 that much, but jumping into Acts 21, uh, I'll just read part of it and then share one mini thought and that's it. So, and when, this is Paul speaking, and when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kaz and the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. So they're bopping around. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed in Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples in Tyre, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When our days were there, we ended. We departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. Um, that's through six, so I'll just stop there. But we have Paul going to Tyre, and... 
immediately when they land, they seek out other believers in the city. And part of me is just curious how those connections, I mean, it's just cool to see the early church just interconnected and the hospitality of the early church. So they come and they stay with these disciples for seven days. And I can just imagine what those seven days were like. I'm sure it had teaching. I'm sure it had worship. I'm sure it had sharing of stories, um, good and bad, of persecution and of God's glory. Um, and they have this sweet departure where they go to the, the whole families, the wives, the children, the husbands. They're all going down, all the way to the outside of the city to say goodbye to to Paul and his company and they kneel down on the beach and it says they pray that's verse five and then they say goodbye to each other but I'm particularly drawn to this kneeling down on the beach and praying and I wonder what their prayers were about um, I'm sure they touched on the persecution of the church I'm sure they touched on Paul's safety and his journey and his ambition to preach the gospel to people who have never heard. Um, but I also bet they prayed for the city of Tyre, that God would visit it again, that God would show up, and um, that Tyre would see who Jesus truly is. And then they said farewell. And I'm, I don't really have a wrap up thought other than maybe just something that's been on my mind is what are you praying for? What nations are you praying for? In fact, this is just coming to my mind Proverbs. Um, yeah, sorry, this will take me a hot second not planned um you know we look at the proverbs 31 woman um sorry y'all one of the verses that i'm remembering that's not coming to me immediately is that she sets her heart upon the nation um let's see Hopefully I can find this. If not, oh well. Oh well. Well, what nations have you set on your heart? What nations are you praying for? Um, this is something I was recently convicted of that um, had been a practice before in various devotionals that set it up for me to pray for different nations, um, not just my own nation, but other nations, for um, them to know who Jesus is, but also just for their political climates, for the oppression, for whatever may be going on in that nation, human trafficking. And so um, this is only like three days in for me, like determining to start to pray for other nations, but it matches well with this. Um, are you praying for other nations? Um, and what are your prayers? And why don't we all get on our knees and pray for other nations? It kind of, what it does to the heart is it reminds you that this is not just about you, that your life is not just about you, that there are other things going on in this world other than your little circle um, especially, I feel like America is tied up in its own little world, in the American church too. And yet, as we step out of that Western church mentality and realize that there is a world out there and a world of Christians and many Christians who are under in persecution. So let's just be mindful of where our prayers are. And I can't look one more time for that verse because it was so good. Um, I may not be able to find it. 
I'll try to find it and I'll put it down in the description box. So, have a great day. Bye!